Dr. Bowen here back with you for another session of microbiology boot camp. Our talk today is going to be on enterococci or gamma hemolytic strep. The two are not exactly synonymous as we're going to see, but old habits are hard to break and uh, you're going to hear a lot of people refer to gamma hemolytic strep and enterococci as synonymous. They're not technically, they haven't been since the 1980s, but we still, uh, we, we still hear that. So um, this is the way I was taught it, unfortunately, and so I have the bad habit too, but I, uh, I put gamma hemolytic strep in parentheses here uh, so that you know that these two are often referred to synonymously, but we're going to go into the difference between the two. Now, if you're going through these videos in sequence, this is the last of the gram-positive cocci, so congratulations, you've made it through all of them. Uh, if you haven't, then I would suggest going through each of them. I try to keep my video short, but I, uh, you know, sometimes I record it two or three times so that I make sure that I keep it concise but cover everything. And I do believe that everything that I, I talk about is very relevant for the step. So I encourage you to watch through these videos. If you think I'm talking too slow, which I generally tend not to do, go ahead and speed me up. But, uh, but again, these are very uh, relevant things for your step. All right, uh, if you haven't had the opportunity yet, to consider subscribing to my Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash pwbmd. You can get there by clicking on the link below in the video or on the I button on the upper right hand corner. If you consider chipping in dollar a month, a uh, little bit goes a long way to help keep these videos free and coming. I know that it's a lot to ask, especially nowadays with the pandemic and everything going on, uh, but I really appreciate all the support that I can get. Um, otherwise, you can go ahead and subscribe to my YouTube page. You'll get alerts and notifications as new videos come up, which I try to put new videos up now uh, every few days with this new uh, series that I've got going on. But otherwise, uh, feel free to patronize my advertisers. Um, I really appreciate it. So thank you very much in advance for your consideration. Without further ado, let's get into our material here. I did a video on gram-positive general characteristics already, so go back and watch that video. This is very testable material. You want to be familiar with the entire structure of the gram-positive cell wall and the gram-negative cell wall. Is this clinically relevant? No. Is it relevant for step one? Yes. So you got to know this, and it really sucks, but... Uh, you, you, you have to know this. And there's only a couple things here that really uh, have any cl clinical relevance whatsoever. But if you don't know this stuff, you're going to miss questions on your step. I guarantee it. The gram stain's the most important stain in all of microbiology, but it's not the only one. Uh, but I do suggest that you know why gram positive stain gram positive, why they are purple and why gram negatives are pink. Um, so I go through this in detail in the other talk. So I'm not going to talk about that again here because I'm going to try to keep this video short. We're going to go through the classification as usual. You should have your algorithm in front of you. You should know it cold. A lot of times on the test, they'll give you a test question where it's a vignette and you know the bacteria that is behind it. But then they'll ask you, is this catalase positive or catalase negative, bacitrase insensitive, bacitrase and resistant, and so on and so forth. So you've got to know this stuff cold. If you don't know it, you're going to miss test questions. If you do know it, it's easy points. So memorize this. There's really no other way to do it. We'll talk about the characteristics. There's not very many that you need to know, unlike mm, uh, strep pyogenes. So uh, this should keep the video a little shorter. We'll talk about the diseases. None of these things are enterococcus or strep bovis, the number one cause, uh, but they are clinically relevant diseases and you should be familiar with the symptomatology of them because they can come up in the exam. Uh, and then finally we'll finish up with a story. Uh, I again put my best effort into it but I am not an artist or a, uh, a creative person so hopefully you like it but uh, we'll see. This is a good algorithm for you that I put together uh, detailing the gram-positive cocci. I could put all of these in detail but it would 
I would run out of room. So as we move on to the gram positive bacilli, you'll see that these the, the gram positive bacilli will be detailed and the other ones will be collapsed. But uh, know that catalase positive is synonymous with staph. When we're talking about gram positive cocci, catalase negative is synonymous with strep. Staph are clusters, strep are chains. Once you know you're dealing in strep, then you're going to plate it on sheep blood agar and look for the hemolysis pattern. What we're talking about here is gamma hemolytic, so you're not going to see any hemolysis. That's the funny thing. We call it gamma hemolytic, but it's actually not hemolytic at all. So that's just how it's classified. Once you know that you've got gamma hemolytic strep, your very next step is going to be to see if it grows on 6.5% sodium chloride. So this is a little different. With the alpha and the beta hemolytic uh, strep, we did uh, an antibiotic sensitivity test. With the gamma hemolytic strep, we're going to see if it grows on 6.5% sodium chloride. If it does, then it's a member of the Enterococcus family, either Fecalis or Fecium. And you don't need to know the difference between those two. If it does not grow on sodium chloride, then it's strep bovis. And I just want to point out to you right now that strep bovis is a cause of endocarditis. And when you see endocarditis, subacute bacterial endocarditis, and the patient blood grows strep bovis, it is colon cancer until proven otherwise. And in, in real life, only about 50% of strep bovis endocarditis is associated with colon cancer. Before step one, just assume it's 100% because they test you on this. So strep bovis, think uh, bovis in the blood, cancer in the colon, all right? What is gamma hemolysis? It's no hemolysis. So you just see these colonies growing on the sheep blood agar. Beta hemolysis was complete. Alpha hemolysis is partial. You see this sort of green sheen on it. This is a nice picture here uh, illustrating the difference between Staph aureus and Enterococcus fecalis. Remember that Staph aureus is beta hemolytic. So you see this zone of clearing where there's hemolysis. Enterococcus fecalis being a gamma hemolytic strep, you see nothing. So you see no, no clearing, you see no green, it's just colonies growing on the agar. This is another picture of what gamma hemoly hemolysis looks like, nothing. So we talked about this, strep is gram-positive cocci and chains, they're all catalase negative, gamma hemolytic means there's no hemolysis, these are all facultative anaerobes, and then you differentiate it with the sodium chloride growth. So all of this stuff can be tested on step one. So that's why I put it here. Some general characteristics of enterococci. There are a couple of virulence factors that allows it to be infective. One is that it's vancomycin resistant. Now that doesn't make it more infective, but it does make it harder to treat. So not all of the enterococci, not all strains are vancomycin resistant. Some of them can be just treated with ampicillin, but for the exam, assume that all enterococci are vancomycin resistant. And if you've got a patient in real life in the hospital that acquires an enterococcal infection, then you really should assume it's vancomycin resistant because nosocomial infections with enterococci are a real problem. And this is the so-called VRE, vancomycin resistant enterococci that you hear talked about. Uh, they are they engage in esculin hydrolysis, and that's just a fancy way of saying that they grow in the presence of bile salts, that they are capable of doing that. And that allows enterococci to cause biliary tract infections. Normally, bile is a pretty crappy place for bacteria to grow, uh, but the ability to do this allows the bacteria to grow in the presence of bile. Also, enterococci are PYR positive. What else is PYR positive? Remember our pyromaniac pyogenes? PYR positive strep pyogenes is PYR positive. So that was part of our beta hemolytic strep. And then strep bovis, really no virulence factors to speak of. The big thing you need to know with strep bovis is bovis in the blood, cancer in the colon. The diseases caused by these bacteria, none of these diseases are, uh, are strep bovis or enterococci the number one cause, uh, but you should be familiar with each of these diseases from a clinical perspective. So obviously UTI, pain in urination, super, super pubic pelvic pain, say that five times fast, 
Um, so UTI, it's only about 5% of cases, and your treatment is going to be identical. Uh, you'll treat it with like amoxicillin, clavulanate, or something like that. Only about 5% of cases, but it is the most common disease that enterococcus is implicated in. Of course, this can cause septicemia and sepsis, in particular when you have GI or GU instrumentation. Uh, both of these bacteria are native to the GI tract, so if you do an endoscopy and you've got a patient then who develops sepsis, it's probably enterococcus or gram-negative rods. Uh, subacute bacterial endocarditis. Remember back to our strep viridans. That's the big cause of bacterial endocarditis. Well, strep bovis can do it as well. And when it does, it is associated with colon cancer. Biliary tree infections. We already talked about cholecystitis. Remember your symptoms of that. Right upper quadrant pain fever uh, comes on gradually worsened with, uh, with a meal, typically because it is associated with a, uh, a a gallstone and then you develop a secondary infection on top of that. So uh, look for that on uh, your step, but again it's not the number one cause. Typically cholecystitis is a polymicrobial etiology. And then finally bacterial peritonitis. So we haven't talked about that yet in any of our talks. Uh, bacterial peritonitis, the number one cause are gram-negative rods, but enterococci can do it as well, in particular when you have some sort of underlying cause. So uh, things like cirrhosis or ascites can cause a spontaneous peritonitis. When you think of spontaneous peritonitis, you want to think of very chronic underlying conditions like cirrhosis or ascites. The symptomatology there is generally a low-grade fever that comes on indolently and then progresses to a diffuse abdominal pain with or without guarding, and then that's going to get worse as the patient develops sepsis. They'll get an altered mental status, and then on labs, you're going to see exactly what you'd expect to see with a bacterial infection, elevated white count, neutrophils, and so forth. Secondary peritonitis comes generally more from a, a more acute cause, so think of things that uh, disturb the GI tract, like a perforated gast gastric ulcer, uh, ruptured appendix, bowel necrosis, which can either be due to uh, mesenteric artery ischemia, for instance, uh, or uh, like strangulation if you've got a, a, a hernia. And this will be more fulminant. So you've got a patient that has a sudden onset of pain and they really deteriorate very quickly. Um, a lot of times this is, is pretty pretty deadly. All right, so we've got our, our story here, and this takes place at an animal museum. Notice that the colors are very purplish, like all of our gram-positive bugs. And this is the entrance of the animal museum. So think entrance, think enterococci. Who's waiting in line? Well, actually, uh, so we notice up here uh, there's a porta potty for these people waiting in line, and uh, the porta potty is to help you remember that fecalis and fecium are uh, here. And everything on the right side are going to pertain to enterococcus, and everything on the left side is going to pertain to strep bovis. So, okay, who's waiting in line? Well, grandma's waiting in line. Grandma, gamma, gamma hemolysis. And Grandma decided to bring her little shit of a grandson with her, and he is starting fires. I don't know why she brought him with, but think of pyromaniac, PYR positive. Enterococci are PYR positive. Despite her grandson being a little brat, she brought him a pretzel to snack on while waiting in line. Think of pretzels are salty, salty, 6.5% sodium chloride. Enterococcus grows on 6.5% sodium chloride. Okay, so what are these animals here? Well, we got our bile crocodile right in the middle, so it pertains to both. Both of these can grow on bile salts and uh, thus cause a biliary tree infection, but for that we're mostly thinking of enterococcus. Our porta potty here also suggests uh, and reminds us of a UTI. Enterococcus causes 5% of UTI infections. Notice that while Grandma waits uh, with her uh, snotty little grandson that she is knitting, and uh, like nice grandmas do, and she's knitting a heart. And she's knitting a heart because enterococcus and strep bovis both cause endocarditis. 
Okay, now they're done with the animal museum and they're getting picked up by the van and this van is locked. Notice the big X on it and it's locked because Enterococcus is often vancomycin resistant. And what do we do when we've got vancomycin resistant uh, Enterococcus? We will treat it with linazolid by the lines on the van or by this cute little tiger, Tigacycle. On the left side, we're dealing with strep bovis. Remember that the uh, bovis is bovine, that's the Latin for cow. So we've got a nice little cow here. And notice that the cow is far away from the pretzel. Cows don't eat pretzels, do they? Or at least they shouldn't. Uh, so strep bovis does not grow on sodium chloride. Also remember that this cow has a cancer awareness ribbon, a colon cancer awareness ribbon, and that's because you should think bovis in the blood, cancer in the colon. It's got purple penicillin pencil horns here, uh, but I really don't recommend uh, thinking about penicillin when you've got uh, endocarditis because there's so many bacteria that are resistant that penicillin is probably not the best first choice, um, at least for exam purposes. The other drug we can use for strep bovis is much more preferable, and that is our three-sided ax for ceftriaxone. So third generation cephalosporins are good for, uh, for strep bovis. All right, that's all I've got for you. Hopefully you enjoyed this and enjoyed the, the gram-positive cocci. Next, we're going to talk about the gram-positive bacilli. So I will see you there.